You're listening to episode 878 of the Father Bills Podcast. Welcome back. Well, this week's episode, I recorded it from my iPhone at the Ambo instead of our normal system, uh, just because the homily I gave in the other masses was a little shorter, and I wanted to have the, let's say, the, the longer form version for the podcast, but that means the audio quality is a little less, so you hear a lot of echo because of the church. In the meantime, this is the homily entitled Beyond Doubt, given on the second Sunday in Easter, 2023. A father once said to his son, remember son, a smart person always has doubts about something. Only an idiot has, has to be 100 for sure, certain about everything. Dad, are you sure? He replied, absolutely son. In today's gospel, we hear about the doubts of St. Thomas. While we might simply resign to calling him doubting Thomas, right? We must be aware that all of the, the disciples doubted him. And we can see this in Matthew 28, 17, at the end of the gospel where we hear, when they saw him, they worshiped, but they doubted. In fact, it was Thomas who was the first among the disciples to proclaim post-resurrection the truth about who Jesus was, right? We heard this, my Lord and my God. So how do we move beyond our doubts. How can we have faith beyond our doubts? That is the question I'd like to prepare for us to answer. The first thing is not to be afraid of your doubts. At one time or another, we all entertain and experience doubts. It's part of being human. And it is true that doubts can diminish our faith but they can also be a catalyst to increase it. How we handle doubts is the key. It needs to be said that the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Sometimes a healthy, though, sense of doubt is better than certainty. Case in point, last Monday, I was visiting my sister Marianne in Independence, Oregon, and I was talking to her about the smart home kit, the Apple home kit that I use at the house, how amazing it is to be able to automate things. So she has a couple lamps that she can just say, I won't say the word Siri, I'll use the word Shlomo. So, hey Shlomo, turn on the lights, lights turn on, etc. I didn't say that though, I actually said Siri. When I explained how wonderful it would be if the garage door opener could do that for her, like it does mine. All I have to say is, Shlomo, open the garage door. I was certain that nothing would happen because I'm an independence. <laughs> A day later, my neighbor texts me and says, by the way, I just realized your garage door has been open all day. <clears throat> and I finally came over at 8.45 p.m. to close it and check out the house. And I can actually, then I go back to my home kit. I can see the cameras. And like, sure enough, he's wandering through the house, checking everything. And oh, my enlightened sense of certainty did not prove out to be the case. I was certain and wrong. And I'm very thankful for kind neighbors. That said, though, if we reject everything that we doubted, on the other hand, that'd be a very dangerous path. So here are some things I do when I encounter doubt. And do I encounter doubt? Oh, yes, lots. First of all, I allow my doubt to be the catalyst for understanding, not the other way around. Instead of giving in to or remaining lazy, In my state of doubt, I look for evidence of what the church teaches and why. Now, of course, I went to seminary, so this is probably easy for me to look these things up. But, you know, you could go on Catholic websites, make sure they're Catholic. (laughs) But see, I'm responsible for the gift of faith that is given to me. God has given me the gift of faith, and I'm to stir it, kindle it, nurture it. And when I'm lazy, I do none of the above. 
So I need to continue educating myself, even as a priest. You know, in the case of St. Thomas, he was in the midst of some kind of grief, right? Think about it. He'd been with Jesus all of this time, and he had not seen yet Jesus arise. He did not see the risen Jesus, though his friends, the other disciples had. But what was his exclamation upon given more information? My Lord and my God. Jesus responds, right? He's blessed. He actually questions him. You know, you see and you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. When I was a freshman at Oregon State, I lived in a Christian co-op called Varsity House. And I met some of the most amazing, passionate, and inspirational Christians there. And there are a few, let's just say, difficult ones. Those few are what I can remember, for sure, as well, because on occasion they would accuse me of not being a Christian. You're a Catholic, what are you doing in this place? This is for Christians. Or another, after we celebrated a, a trophy, we got a trophy for winning an intramural football game, came up to me, this one gentleman and said, here, worship this trophy like you worship the statues of Mary. Now I could just sit there on my laurels and just whimper. No, that inspired me to get busy about where I am lacking in my understanding of my faith and be able to explain it. Um, um, believe me, I did. Uh, no bad deed went unchallenged by me. Let's put it that way. And you know what? It grew me closer to these gentlemen that I had conflict with. No longer did they challenge me as a non-Christian. Now they actually understood what it meant to venerate saints. See how it flipped? So number two, I strive to come to understanding, but in a place of trust, not distrust, not skepticism, but of trust. When I have a moment of doubt, I recourse to logic and history. And I have to remind myself that the scriptures and the church speak coherently together and affirm the reality of who Jesus was, that he literally was real. He really did teach. He really did say what he said. He really did die, and it is a historic fact that he rose from the dead. Now, if you listen to the History Channel, they'll stop right before that rising from the dead thing. They'll talk about the Christ of history, and, or the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Like, dumb people believe that part. But they fail to know and recognize that there's extra biblical texts to it that attest to the Christian church and its earliest witnesses of Christ and his resurrection. So I engage my faith with understanding. And I do so with an attempt to understand, not to disprove. And when I run into the contrary things, which I also will look to, I'll look to, say, contrary beliefs and try to get a sense of where they come from. And sometimes it becomes obvious where the holes are. I'm very cautious about whenever the, our culture speaks about our faith because they come from a perspective, which they only can do, from politics, power, fame, or pleasure. Not truth. Think about it. The bottom line is to sell newspapers, to get clicks. They're motivated by something other than the truth. They're motivated by all these other things. So they're biased. That's where I would encourage us all to go to Catholic websites if you need help in understanding. Don't go to CNN, although they have news. Don't go to the Oregonian, though they have news. Go to a Catholic website, and they will give you the best information. There's also people like us priests, deacons, lay ministers in our church, where you can go and share your struggles with. And I want to let you know I'm open to that. I love doing that. I've trained myself in apologetics to be able to explain the faith because of my history. St. Peter tells us that we should be able to explain a reason for our hope. Do you feel equipped to do that? Most people don't. But they're scared. Of it. I get it. But don't let that be an excuse to be lazy about it. Come get information. Learn. Read. Come to us. I'm happy to talk with you. Another example. When I was at the Oregon Star Party. You know I'm a nerd, right? So I had my telescope set up there, and a gentleman, an engineer from the Keck Observatory, gave a wonderful talk. Later that day, he approached my campsite. Remember, this is a place of 700 geeks, their, their tents, their, their RVs, and their telescopes, way out in the middle of the Ochico National Forest. And he came to my campsite, possibly because he saw this seven-foot banner that said, 
the Vatican Observatory Foundation on my car. <laughs> and he was curious because he said, you know, I've read the entire Bible. I invited him to sit down. And he said, it's full of myths and inac- inaccuracies. My parents are Christians, but I do not believe. He said that the stories of Genesis are just dumb. I said, you know what? You're reading it like a fundamentalist. I'm a Catholic Christian. I'm not a fundamentalist. You've made a fundamental error in interpreting those creation stories as some kind, some kind of scientific play-by-play when it's actually poetry trying to describe and answer the who and the why, not the how. That's why we have physics. That's why God has revealed these things to us. And then I went on to explain to him that there's some people that you may know who are incredibly incredibly faithful Catholics, namely the, the father of the Big Bang. Do you know who that is? He didn't know. I said, George Lemaitre, I mean, Father George Lemaitre, a contemporary of Einstein. Or you know Angelo Secchi, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah the father of astrophysics. Mm-hmm. Father Angelo Secchi, S.J. He went home, he went into his blog, and he was complimentary of all the people that are going to start a party. And he even mentioned me. I met a priest there. It was fun. I mean, that's better than saying he was a jerk, right? <laughs> Number three, last one, and I'll, I'll be quiet. Don't stop praying. When you have doubt, don't stop going to Mass. Don't stop going to confession. In fact, all of these things are critical to our continued growth in faith. And when we find ourselves doubting, start asking, hmm, have I stopped going to Mass? Have I stopped praying? Or am I in need of going to confession? Because all of these things, when we remove them, introduce doubt. Because God has given us a faith and it needs to be nurtured. It's not just autopilot. Because when we are on autopilot, I know me, I get lazy, and I go from the easiest point to the next easiest point, And the easiest point for my couch in my living room is the other side of the couch. I'm not coming to church. I mean, just turn on the television. We watch it streaming even now, right? When I was a seminarian, this is related, I was at All Saints uh, here in Portland on a pastoral year. And I was the sponsor for a teenager from Mount Angel for confirmation. And she had an amazing awakening through confirmation. She was an amazing, passionate young lady in her faith. Her and her family went to Mexico the next year for a family trip to experience Christmas without all the trappings of our culture. I was saddened to hear about her loss because she was killed in a car accident in Mexico. And upon hearing that, I was just numb, stunned to my core, and here I was, a seminarian, teaching RCIA, right? Trying to help new Catholic or new people become Catholic, right? I didn't stop believing, but I was angry at God. If this is what you do to your faithful young people, no wonder you have so few friends. But see, I didn't just sit there with that. I sought out counseling, and I gave it. I gave my thoughts to God. I told him what for. I gave him all my anger. But I went to counseling, and I saw and I realized that anger can be a defense mechanism when not being able to deal with loss. It keeps me far away from the loss, and I don't have to deal with it because I just keep everybody at distance, myself included, to myself. But see, once I finally was able to grapple with the loss, guess what? My anger disappeared, and my faith became even more vibrant and stronger. And it was that year that I finally said, yes, I am now committed to this priesthood thing. I got two years left, but I am now on fire because you may have heard my story before. I was like barely even in seminary when I joined. Archbishop Levada said, well, how would you like to go to Rome? This is my introductory interview with him. Like, Archbishop, I am barely here. He goes, oh, never mind. (laughs) Off I went to Mount Angel. While St. Thomas is considered... Uh, sometimes a doubting Thomas, right? He was blessed for having seen and believed. In many ways, we are even more blessed or blessed because while we haven't seen Jesus walking around in the flesh like Thomas did, we have the Eucharist. 
We bump into him there and in the confession. We see him. He's present in our midst. And so when we come to Mass, this is the way we lift up and get beyond our doubts. These things I offer to you as ways to live beyond doubt. Thank you again for listening to this episode of the Father Bills Podcast. If you have any questions or comments, go to my website, fatherbill.org, F-R-B-I-L-L dot org. And there you can email me. You can see what's going on on my uh, social media platforms and go from there. There's also other podcasts and also my Friday Reflections. Those are videos that are posted on YouTube. In the meantime, may God bless you and have a great week. Bye-bye.